Good. Yeah. So we're turning to Romans chapter 10. I think it's maybe the third occasion. We considered it first from the prayers of the apostle for the salvation of his kinsmen particularly, but salvation in general. Last time I believe we looked at the hindrances to salvation that were in the heart, the mind, the affections and the will. And uh, this evening I want to look at being saved. What is, what is it to be saved? Simple question. Apparently it's a rare expression in many churches today to talk about people being saved. It's the most vital matter. Most vital matter. And I want to first look at that uh, there is this great matter, a definite uh, difference between sa being saved and unsaved. And then to consider the basis of salvation, the righteousness of Jesus Christ, and then thirdly, the instrument of salvation, um, that it is by faith, God's grace by faith. So these things hopefully will be of some help and encouragement to us. Now, the first thing is then, that is that the saved person, you see here, Paul's desire for Israel was that they might be saved. Something was going to change. Something needed to change. And then it said that if thou believed, verse 9, in thine heart that God hath raised him from the dead, thou shalt be saved. It was going to be something that hadn't happened to something that would happen. A change would occur. And whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. Before they call upon the Lord, they're not saved. But after they call upon the Lord, they are saved. So we can know there's a definite change that takes place when a person is saved. And we can know for ourselves whether we are saved or not. You might say, well, what's this talk about being saved? Who needs to be, what are you going to save me from? Of course, our sins, God's wrath and hell is a very, very, serious matters so people need to be saved and can be saved this is the good news the glad tidings of salvation that you see the people in here they had a zeal for God but they didn't have a knowledge not a zeal verse 2 a zeal but not according to knowledge there was a desire for God people are like that They're religious people they call them religious fanatics. Some of them, they say, they might say we're religious fanatics, but they're, they're, it's we have according to knowledge a true zeal for God. It's different from from the false zeal when there's no knowledge. So when they're saved, they have a real knowledge and a real zeal. And then in verse three, you see that the person that's not saved has got a whole wrong approach. Well, we've already mentioned there's, a, there's this religious this thing, but not according to the knowledge of the gospel. But then it explains it in verse 3 here, being ignorant of God's righteousness, they're going about to establish their own righteousness. We had a similar, um, similar at the end of um, chapter 9, there was a similar expression about the... the, the the, the righteousness, they, they hadn't attained to the righteousness, the people of Israel, uh, because they sought it by faith rather than works, verse 32. And then, so, there's this wrong approach to, to righteousness, as if, as if they could establish their own righteousness. This is the unsaved person, but the saved person is, knows about God's righteousness which we'll come to in, in, our, in our next point, then it's a matter of faith rather than law. The unsaved person thinks about, uh, spoke to a man earlier on, he said uh, whether he was ready for heaven, oh, well he hasn't, I've not done anything wrong. Well, it's about we're saved by faith, not by what we've not done wrong, and of course people have done things wrong, they just don't admit it, or they're not aware of some of it, but it says here, the end, Christ is the end of the law for righteousness. Jesus Christ. For everyone that believeth. Something's believed. 
a person that's saved believes they're not someone that's trying to establish their own righteousness by the law and then the question then of course are we saved does this ring a bell to you does this which side do you sit on one side or the other of this the, this you don't sit on the fence there's you there's no sitting on the fence you're either saved or not saved there's no halfway measure in first peter chapter 3 and verse 21 um, talks about verse 20 about Noah, the days of Noah and then it says this was like uh, a figure where unto even baptism doth also now save us being saved not, not the actual baptism of water though it says not the putting away of the filth of the flesh but the answer of a good conscience toward God by the resurrection of Jesus Christ. You see, the resurrection of Jesus Christ means that he has conquered sin, he's conquered death. And so those with faith in Jesus Christ have a good conscience toward God because their sins are forgiven. And so there's, there's this uh, baptism of the Holy Spirit that has come upon them. Now, we, we see this again in uh, 1 Peter again chapter 1 and verse uh, 21 it says um, uh -huh. I think I've maybe written down the wrong verse uh -huh. no, that's, that's verse 23 sorry verse 23 being born again not of corruptible seed but of incorruptible by the word of God which liveth and abideth forever. A person that's been saved has been born again. Not by corruptible, that means something that's going to die and be finished with, but incorruptible, can never die by the word of God. So the gospel has been preached and a person has been born again by this invisible but incorruptible word. And uh, the se a seed has gone, has come from God, and he's implanted something. It's salvation, it's faith, it's hope in Jesus Christ has come. This is the promise to someone who's been saved. And in Titus, the epistle that Paul writes to this early church leader, Titus, in chapter 3 and verse 5, we read, uh, well, I read from verse 4. But after the loving, after the kindness and love of God, our Saviour. So you can compare it. I was saying there's an unsaved and a saved. Let's go back to verse 3 and you'll see the unsaved person. For we ourselves also were sometimes foolish, disobedient, deceived, serving diverse loves and lusts and pleasures, living in malice and envy, hateful and hating one another. Well, we aren't perfect, but you see some of these characteristics, living in malice and envy and hateful and hating one another, that's the unsaved. Not that they're always, always behaving in that way, obviously. But, after that the kindness and love of God our Saviour toward man appeared, not by works of righteousness which we had done, but according to his mercy, he saved us by the washing of regeneration and renewing of the Holy Ghost. So there's this regeneration work, which is like a washing, washing away of sin, and a renewing, a renewing, a new birth, a new life from the Holy Ghost, from the Holy Spirit of God. He saved us. There's this testimony that the apostles have. He has, he's writing to Titus, he's speaking of Christians, in general, real Christians, real born-again Christians, not people that just say they're Christians. Um, they say, I was reading something earlier, said, if you say that you're prepared to say that you believe what the Roman Catholic Church believes, even if you don't know what they believe, you don't have to believe anything, you just say you're going to go along with whatever they say, they count you as a Christian. They don't count you as someone that's going to heaven, but they count you as a Christian. 
as part of their church. So that's all you, that you need to do. You don't need to be born again. You don't need to be saved. You just go along with them, and that 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 that'll do, as it were. Now, here though, we see a definite, definite salvation and a definite change. And that, so this is what we're going to look at. This is what we want to know about. How does it happen? What is it about that makes someone saved, makes someone a Christian? This must be the most vital matter, mustn't it? I mean, we've got more. I mean, I could speak about this every sermon, really, and not speak about very many other things because this is what actually gives cheer to the soul this enables a christian to live a godly life because we love the lord jesus if he saved us if you've been saved it a man's been saved from a shipwreck and the person that brought him up they just they can't do enough for them can can, can they do well how can they repay them but how how do they live in response to it well how much more to be saved from our sins, to be saved from hell by the Lord Jesus. But how, how is it done? Well, we've seen some of the things here already a little bit, but let's just focus on um, the expression here, Christ is the end of the law for righteousness. Verse 4 here. Christ is the end of the law for righteousness. Uh, um, we need righteousness, you see. All we have is sinfulness. All we have is, is God's wrath upon us. A person is... We have a, we have a sinful nature. And it, we, we have Adam's, Adam's sin, the sin of the first parents. That is us. That is us. That rebellion in the Garden of Eden. That is us. That's our nature. And that's our way. And you'll take it... If, if it was in the box and it was hidden down there and you weren't to look in the box and no one was around you look in the box you see what was there I know someone's saying no to this but we've all sinned we've all had wrong thoughts bad thoughts and even actions as well we are meant to love God with all our heart and our neighbours as ourselves this is a very great commandment to be like the Lord Jesus Christ to be perfect as our Father in Heaven is perfect. Anyone still shaking their hands about being a sinner? It says in Romans 3, further back, that there is none righteous. To be righteous is to be perfectly straight and upright and completely never ever do anything wrong. Romans 3.10 There is none righteous, no, not one. They're all gone out the way, they're all together become unprofitable. There is none that doeth good, no, not one. Their throat, yeah, so where their speech, their mouth, it's all full of cursing, bitterness, etc., etc. The way of peace, they've not known. There's no fear of God before their eyes. None is righteous. Isaiah chapter 64, and verse, which I'm not turning to now, and verse 6 says, We're all as an unclean thing, and all our righteousnesses are as filthy rags. Our best, our best we can ever do, and you can go and appear before God and say, look what I've done, look how righteous I am. And God say, filthy. That's our best. That's the best we could do before God. Now, Despite that, these people that we read over in here are trying to establish their own righteousness. Trying to establish... Oh, yes. But yes, but Christ, they've missed the point. Christ is the law. The end of the, see, this is why this gospel is, as it says in verse 15, glad tidings of good things. To have the gospel of Jesus Christ, it is good news because he absolutely saves. And it's his righteousness that's counted to the uh, believer. Now, Christ is the end of the law for righteousness. Now remember, in Matthew chapter 3, when Jesus was baptised, uh, what was he to be baptised for? Uh, baptism is for, was it for the remission of sin? What, why would Jesus be baptised? He said it was to fulfil all righteousness. And it's actually very hard to think you think, well, even then he didn't need to be, well, why was he still baptised? It is a mystery to me, and it still remains a mystery. We're not 
we're told it's to fulfill all righteousness. It doesn't make him righteous. He is righteous. But he, he, he goes through this. And in some ways, Jesus' baptism is his, is his ordination. Because then the Spirit comes down on him and the Father speaks from heaven. And he's sent off into his ministry. So he's kind of setting him up like that. But it's not really for the forgiveness of sins. It's hard to quite see it. But he says it's to fulfill all righteousness. He goes beyond what you could think he would do to make everything we were talking about signing the book earlier on and we must do it correct and put the right number on and because that's what we said that's the right thing to do and here Jesus Christ even to fulfill all righteousness was baptized and it, indeed it was that time of special blessing and it is an amazing time but how could he be so righteous this is what we're talking about by righteousness absolutely beyond as completely perfect I like to get things roughly right but with righteousness is exactly right and so when we read in Philippians chapter 2 of the Lord Jesus it says he being in the form of God thought it not robbery to be equal with God it was equal with God but it, 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 he, he wasn't robbing God by being equal with God because he is God because but he made himself of no reputation took upon him the form of a servant and was made in the likeness of men and being found in fashion as a man he humbled himself and became obedient unto death even the death of the cross he didn't need to do that what, why? well this was his saving death it was a perfect man giving himself as a sacrifice for sin and so in 1 John and I think I was going to look at several texts here 1 John chapter 2 verse 1 and 2 my little children these things write down to you that you sin not and if any man sin we have an advocate with the father Jesus Christ the righteous and he is the propitiation for our sin the propitiation the this is a, a word that comes from the Old Testament word where they have the mercy seat on top of the ark and uh, there's an offering made there but it propitiates there's a it's a sacrifice for sin that is made and this is Jesus Christ if any man sin what are we going to do we're going to go to hell no we have a propitiation, we have a saviour, we have an offering, for sin. something's been done to appease God's wrath at sin. And so in Hebrews chapter 7, Hebrews chapter 7 and a few verses from here, very, very precious. Verse 25, Hebrews 7, he is able to also to save them to the uttermost that come unto him by God seeing he ever liveth to make intercession for them he didn't just give himself as a sacrifice he's alive from the dead now Jesus Christ for such an high priest became us who is holy harmless undefiled separate from sinners and made higher than the heavens who needeth not daily as those high priests to offer up sacrifice first for his own sins and then for the people's but this he did once when he offered up himself this is what the Lord Jesus Christ did offered up himself for the sins of his people and therefore in 2nd Corinthians chapter 5 verse 21 we read for he hath made him to be sin for us who knew no sin that we might be made the righteousness of God in him now we need to talk about this righteousness there's a righteousness Jesus Christ is the end of the law for righteousness and him being made sin for us 
that we might be made the righteousness of God in him. It's a bit frightening. I don't think I can take on such a righteousness as this. I don't think I'm worthy of it. But that's why Christ gave himself for our sins, that the people of God would be counted righteous. And so we read in there Jeremiah uh, 23 and verse 6. This is his name whereby he shall be called the Lord our righteousness. The Lord our righteousness. The Lord, yeah, do you want to sit down? No, I can't You're welcome. Sit down. The Lord our righteousness. Jesus Christ is the Saviour for all that come to him. It's a most wonderful Wonderful, wonderful thing that can be done. Be He'll be finished with. No, he'll be quite safe with the Lord Jesus Christ. I don't believe He's it. He's able to absolutely save. You believe it, but yeah. I don't. Oh, you could do. I don't you want to. You will by God's help. grace. Yes, it's possible by God's grace. So that's there in <laughs> Jeremiah 23. Jeremiah, and then in Jeremiah 33 Jonah, and verse 16. Jones. Okay, right then. You mustn't read that. Either listen or don't listen, but we have to shut the door because we don't want to be too, too disturbed. Oh, All right. In those days and at that time will I cause the branch of righteousness to grow up unto David, and he shall execute judgment and righteousness in the land. And in those days shall Judah be saved, and Jerusalem shall dwell safely. And this is the name wherewith she shall be called the Lord our righteousness. Interesting that there's a she there. Uh, be called the Lord our righteousness so this is the the promise of God that the Lord is our righteousness but you see she shall be called this it seems to be an imputed righteousness here you see something is going to apply to the people of God as well and just to take you through a few verses in Isaiah where we're here of some lovely texts Isaiah 45 <clears throat> you see how the people of God will rely on the Lord. Isaiah 45, 24 and 25. Isaiah 45, 24. Surely shall one say, In the Lord have I righteousness and strength. Even to them shall men come, and all that are like incensed against him shall be ashamed. See, in the Lord... Have I righteousness? It's in the Lord. And then in Isaiah 53, verse 11, we read, He shall see of the travail of his soul and shall be satisfied. By his knowledge shall my righteous servant justify many. My righteous servant justifies counts them to be justified is to be counted righteous they he they're counted righteous because no he he is the righteous <coughs> servant and in 54 verse 17 there's another lovely text of the lord's righteousness no weapon that is formed against thee shall prosper great text this isn't it and every tongue that shall rise against thee in judgment, thou shalt condemn. This is the heritage of the servants of the Lord. Now, and their righteousness is of me, saith the Lord. Their righteousness is of me. It's from God. Nice. It's God's. Yes, it's Christ's righteousness that we've read about. But here, it's it's from God. It's from the Lord. And then in chapter 61 and verse 10 there's another one I'm emphasizing these because there's so many of them um, I will greatly rejoice in the Lord my soul shall be joyful in my God for he hath clothed me with the garments of salvation he hath covered me with the robe of righteousness as a bridegroom decketh himself with ornaments and as a bride adorneth herself with the jewels. It reminds me of the, um, of the uh, prodigal son when he was given a robe of righteousness. So you think of the wedding garments that they were wearing in uh, the uh, parable of the wedding, the king's wedding. 
the robe of righteousness. This is the righteousness of Christ. It's, it's put on it, as it were. It covers the believer. It's God's righteousness, Christ's righteousness. And then uh, lastly, in Daniel 9 and verse 24, a verse I'm sure that people read in with other other points to make about it uh, Ezekiel Daniel chapter 9 verse 24 70 weeks are determined upon thy people and upon thy holy city to finish the transgression and to make an end of sins and to make reconciliation for iniquity and to bring in everlasting righteousness this is Referring, you see the next chapter verse refers to the Messiah coming to bring in everlasting righteousness. How could there be such a thing? We're unrighteous. Don't forget we've read all those verses. None is righteous. But we're reading, my righteousness is of the Lord. The Lord our righteousness. Christ. The robe of righteousness that God puts on his people. There is a righteousness from God for the people of God. And it's with this Righteousness. Now, when we're going to talk, we will talk about the blood of Christ shed as a sacrifice for sin. I'm not denying that. That is far, far from it at all. The blood of Christ cleanses us from sin. But in when a person is saved, they have the righteousness of Jesus Christ. You've got the blood of Christ, and it, uh, there's. I think there, there's a hymn. It speaks about. Um, the blood and righteousness, thy blood and righteousness, it's in, it's in several hymns. The two go together. The blood of Christ cleanses us from sin and the righteousness of Christ is counted to us so the person is justified. It's astonishing. It's, as our friend Reverend Brian Fels, who was with us, always used to say, it's more than forgiveness. He says, you're forgiven as a Christian. That's wonderful, he says. But there's more, there's more. You must have more that you're forgiven and counted righteous in Christ. He's completely been a substitute and a saviour for his people. And so this is what we, we saw there in that description in Hebrews, that he was a, a once offered sacrifice, a full, as John said, a propitiation for our sins. So the people of God are counted righteous in Jesus Christ. So I could ask you the question, do you trust the Lord Jesus Christ as your righteousness uh, then you're, sa you're saved uh, and, and, and I'm taking parts of things here of course but, but um, or are you like the people of the world who are going about to establish their own righteousness useless, hopeless, can't be done the hymn says he is all my righteousness I stand complete in him and worship him that's it Jesus Christ the Lord yeah, amen, amen. Yeah, he completed him. There we are. Good. So he is our righteousness. So this is a this is a wonderful uh, a blessing. This is the this is the well, he's with the, the basis of salvation. It is uh, strictly speaking, it's the blood and the righteousness of Christ. He's, because he is the fully righteous sacrifice. So it's it's complete. It's, it's an exp explanation, if you like, of the blood of Christ, to some extent, it, it, that it, it, it's a righteous, a full atonement sacrifice that's made in him. And we stand in Christ, justified. This is the expression, justified by faith, not by works. Now, a Christian who is justified lives for God. How could you not want to live for God and serve the Lord as we were speaking this morning? How could you not if you are saved, if you are saved from hell and you've been given everlasting life in Jesus Christ, how could you not want to live for him? In fact, if you didn't, I'd question whether you'd been saved. Now, we know our, our Christian lives are far from perfect. We, we would wish and pray that we will be more holy, more Christ-like, love the Lord more, uh, appreciate him more and uh, be more faithful in every manner but nevertheless there is a difference there is a difference between the saved and the unsaved and it's seen in this faith in Jesus Christ that he's died for our sins 
and he is our righteousness he's our hope he's our trust a hope that is yours but lastly are we quite early I'm not sure what time we're in lastly well we're asking the question about ourselves whether we're saved now there is an instrument or a means instrument I think is the word the instrumental means I think is the, is the theoretical expression of, of salvation which is faith now we're talking about something very small aren't we can you see it can you feel it you can't see it you can't create it you can't make it up can you feel where does it come from now it's interesting as again I was looking up some uh, sermons on this and the point was made do people believe or not believe because they don't understand is there something intellectual that hinders people from believing from coming to Christ to to receiving his righteousness to being to being washed in his blood it's through faith in Christ is it something no it says in our chapter I'm looking at the wrong epistle Romans here it says in verse 10 for with the heart man believeth unto righteousness it's very interesting isn't it you would think that a person would be thinking and working these things out and then he'd kind of intellectually go oh now I believe now I understand it's gone into my brain these things have happened to Jesus Christ I am this and therefore I believe these things and therefore I'm a Christian and sometimes we can be like that with people try to make them understand and it can be very frustrating because the gospel seems so simple and plain and yet the Bible says in places well it's it's hid from them it says it at the end of this chapter doesn't it all day long I stretch forth my hands unto a disobedient and gainsaying people but with the heart when God gives a person a new heart gets into their conscience it's something in their in their soul they get the whole person is moved it's, it's different from just getting to the break with the things we read it does go through our mind it's got to come through our mind to our heart it's not just some experience out of nowhere but the heart man believes with his heart the whole person has taken it up there was a form of uh, back in the 18th 19th century a type of belief that we, so you've just got to have an intellect you've got to believe these facts believe this about the Lord Jesus and you will be saved and well there's a truth in that but it must be more than that it's not just a, a plain belief in certain facts if the heart is taken we're sinners we're under God's wrath if our heart isn't taken to God then we haven't been saved we haven't believed we've got to believe with the heart I'm not trying to force us or to but I'm saying that we can see that if this hasn't happened person hasn't been saved I've, got to, I've just gone off from my notes here it says in believing in Romans chapter 1 and verse 16 and 17 for I'm not ashamed of the gospel of Christ for it is the power of God unto salvation to everyone that believeth I think that actually says it doesn't it it's the power of God to everyone that believes the a power of God has come upon us in believing the heart can't be dead the heart it can't just be the mind it's got to have moved the power of God has come upon someone to for them to believe the gospel for therein verse 17 is the righteousness of God revealed from faith to faith fantastic expressions in this in in this epistle of course that now so the righteousness we spoke about is revealed from faith to faith it's like saying from faith and on to faith and faith again some people say it's from they explain these this expression but it's a it's definitely it's a um, it's a multiplying it's an extreme expression it's faith and then it, you can see it again the just as it is written the just shall live by faith by faith a person uh, is is living a justified person is living 
by faith in God, in Jesus Christ. So it's by faith this has happened. This righteousness is counted by faith. It's as if it's from nothing. But it's not of nothing. Faith isn't just a thought that's come into your head. Faith isn't just that you're someone that believes and someone else doesn't believe. Faith is a gift of God. Now this is shouldn't shock us. People don't always agree. Not all Christians have quite agreed on this over the over the past. But we, we hold that this is so. And you see it like this in Romans chapter 5 and verse 15. I think it was given 16, but 15 is it was to read from. But not as the offence, so also is the free gift. For if through the offence of one, this is the offence of Adam. Adam, you remember Adam, Adam and Eve? Many be dead. We die because of Adam and Eve. And we're all stuck in that. Much, much more the grace of God and the gift by grace, which is by one man, Jesus Christ, hath abounded unto many. So there's something very great about the gift of God in Jesus Christ. And not as it was by one that sinned, so is the gift. For the judgment, now don't worry about the expressions, sometimes I say when you read the Bible, don't worry about every word you don't get, just concentrate on the ones you do get, and then we'll, you can fill in the, try and fill in the others later. But just listen to this. For the judgment was by one to condemnation, but the free gift is of many offences unto justification. So there's a free gift of God going to justification or being counted righteous, justified. For if by one man's offence death reigned by one, much more they which receive abundance of grace and of the gift of righteousness shall reign in life by one, Jesus Christ. So by, there's an abundance of grace, God's, God's free gift, and of the gift of righteousness. We talked about it being by faith. Faith, uh, we're justified by faith in Christ. But this is this righteousness is a gift from God, and therefore, verse eighteen, as by the offence of one judgment came upon all men to condemnation. Everyone's condemned because of what Adam did. Even so, by the righteousness of one, the free gift came upon all men unto justification of life. For as by one man's disobedience many, many were made sinners, so by the obedience of one shall many be made righteous. And um, I just, I'll just i skip verse 20 not just for time. 21, that as sin hath reigned unto death, so even might grace reign through righteousness unto eternal life by Jesus Christ our Lord. So the grace, of, the grace of God, this gift of God through righteousness, which is seen as the righteousness of Jesus Christ unto eternal life. This is a free gift of God. This righteousness is a free gift. It's by grace there. And by faith, Joining together again, the beginning of Romans 5, verse 2. By whom, also this is by Jesus Christ, we have access by faith into this grace wherein we stand. So the grace, the gift of God's righteousness wherein we stand, we have access by faith. This is the amazing work of God. And... I can just uh, just a few more verses briefly. Romans chapter four, verse nine. It's a bit like when I we, we I've got uh, when you bring all these things together, you can see how they how they fit, can't you? It's the righteousness of Jesus Christ. There's faith and righteousness. There's grace and righteousness, and uh, you see it again here. Romans four, verse nine. Faith was, in the second half of this verse though, faith was reckoned to Abraham for righteousness. There we are. It's, it's, it's God's gift. 
and it's faith gets him the righteousness. Now the righteousness, don't forget, is God's righteousness and it's Jesus Christ's righteousness. It's perfect righteousness. But by faith, he believed God, it was counted for righteousness. And then you see at the end of that chapter, very encouragingly, we read from verse 22, it was imputed to him for righteousness. That is his believing, his promises. He believed God. And then it was not written for his sake alone that it was imputed to him, verse 23, but 24, for us also to whom it shall be imputed if we believe on him that raised up Jesus our Lord from the dead who was delivered for our offences and was raised again for our justification. Faith is imputed for righteousness to the people of God. Jesus Christ is the righteousness. Faith, grace, these things there all come together. So this is where we can stand in Jesus Christ. In Philippians chapter 3 and verse 9, the Apostle Paul can write like this about I'll go from verse 8, Philippians 3, verse 8. Yea, doubtless I count all things but loss for the excellency of the knowledge of Christ Jesus, my Lord. He'll give up everything, everything's gone. I could have lost all things, but I've got Jesus Christ. And so I can count them loss for the excellency of the knowledge of Christ Jesus, my Lord, for whom I've, I've suffered the loss of all things, and do count them but done that I may win Christ and be found in him. And he still goes back and remembers this. Not having mine own righteousness, which is of the law, which was impossible, which wasn't of righteousness, oh. but that which is through the faith of Christ, the righteousness which is of God by faith. This was his standing. This is why he loved the Lord Jesus Christ so much, because he could be found in him. He could be safe in him because he's his righteousness for him. And in 1 Corinthians 1, which we looked at, I think this morning, um, at the end of the chapter, 1 Corinthians chapter 1 and the end, verse 30. Uh, I always like to go back a verse 29. That no flesh should glory in his presence, but of him are ye in Christ Jesus, who of God is made unto us wisdom and righteousness and sanctification and redemption. That according as it is written, he that glorieth, let him glory in the Lord. So you see, Jesus Christ there is the righteousness, the sanctification as well. Interesting, isn't it? The holiness of the people of God is, is found in Jesus Christ. And here I've presented the facts to you that there must be this change made to be saved. There's a change that comes upon them. A person is not saved and a person is saved. I've put to you that this is Christ is the righteousness, the only righteousness of a saved, a person that is saved. They need not to be seeking their own righteousness, but to cast their whole trust in Jesus Christ. He's completely the, a full and sufficient saviour of his people. And I've explained that this righteousness is a gift of God to be believed, to be taken on by faith. And I've said to you, this is not to be to people an intellectual if they're, if they're stumbling at Jesus Christ, it's not an intellectual problem. It's a problem of the heart. Because it's with the heart that the man believes unto righteousness. If we haven't seen our unrighteousness. If we haven't got a consciousness of sin, then we don't need God. We can go on trying to establish our own righteousness. But we're not saved if we do that. We've got to come honestly to God. Lord, I'm a sinner. Have mercy on me, a sinner. And the grounds of acceptance of a sinner are all in the sufficiency of the Lord Jesus Christ. 
and he does receive you he accepts all that come to him we're all called to turn don't perish in your sins don't die in your sins and if you're going to go to heaven and, and appear at the, at the gate of heaven don't expect to say look I haven't done anything wrong the Bible says we're all unrighteous but Jesus Christ is righteousness and faith in him saves a sinner his death was all sufficient a full propitiation, the righteous for the unrighteous, the just for the unjust. So, it's not a problem of the mind that keeps anyone from heaven. It's a problem of the heart. We, we looked at last time, didn't we? We said it's a problem of the mind, the heart, the affections and the will. All of them are bound, all of them are opposed to God. And let us, let us pray for those that we know and love, that God will speak to them. God will open their heart as That's he opened right. Lydia's. And then all the intellectual problems fall away. All the problems about whether they believe about men and women or whether they believe about creation or evolution, they go away and people believe the Bible. When they believe Jesus Christ, they believe his word. And the, the obstacles fall away. The intellectual problems fall away very quickly. They're not the hindrance. The hindrance is the heart of man. The Bible says it's very deceptive. It's very deceitful. It convinces us. Anyone can convince me that they're perfectly good and they've never done a single thing wrong in their whole life. I'm easily convinced about the goodness of people. But God knows our very, very hearts, the deception and the evil that is within us. But give uh, say, give God your heart. But uh, you say, well, I'm dead in sins. What can I do? But cry out to the Lord. Seek the Lord. The Bible says there's none that seeks God. It says that here there was a, a people that, that were no people. Foolish nation. But they became believers. There was others. They, I, found, I was found of them that sought me not. I was made manifest unto them that asked not after me. God is gracious. How gracious he was to people that were going completely the wrong way. Completely the wrong way. Arrogant, ignorant, heaping up sin this after sin after sin. Claiming their own righteousness. The Apostle Paul was the worst. He called himself the chief of sinners. He opposed the gospel of Jesus Christ more than any. He persecuted Christians. There aren't many people that we know and love who would go to that trouble, but he did, and he was saved when Jesus Christ appeared to him, and he shut him up. And this is why some people say they say they have, they've had a dream. They're in a country where the gospel is quite forbidden, but they've heard a little bit about Jesus Christ, perhaps in their other books that they've read, and they wake up one day and they know they must find Jesus Christ. And he breaks through and he does it. And he gets to the heart and the whole soul. And the person knows that they need this saviour, the righteous one. And that's our prayers. I've said this morning, we want to be like the church in Antioch. Who love the word of God. Who commit ourselves to serving the Lord. And seek the Holy Spirit to bless our labours. And we're assured in that, that lovely text. That says, Your labour in the Lord is not in vain. Keep on saying that to yourself. Your labour in the Lord is not in vain. You're serving God. You're seeking to come and listen to the word of God and then to take it in like that milk and grow in the grace. It's not in vain. It may seem it against a hostile, hostile environment we're in. But the grace and the love of God in Jesus Christ, it's what? people need it's what we need isn't it? if you're if you're a born again christian you've been saved by the grace of the lord jesus christ the righteousness of christ is yours and you don't feel you feel so unworthy but god has said accepted he's called them that were unbeloved unbeloved beloved he loves his people jesus loves his people god loves his people and he keeps his people and he'll, he'll help us in this in, the, in these days where the, this world, the further it goes away from God, 
the, the, it should be the more clear the gospel is. The, the, I, I read some, someone had written um, some years ago to say that uh, Britain, the, it's got two choices, um, Islam or Jesus Christ. It thinks it's got the choice of secularism. But secularism can't stand up to Islam. Islam would just swallow up secularism. Only Jesus Christ is the answer for people. There's nothing else to save anybody. So we're in very serious days. And yet this gospel, to the end of the world, until the Lord Jesus comes, is good. I haven't really got a, a conclusion. I'm just encouraging you. If you're saved, praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Be strong in the Lord. You have got the Lord on your side. Yeah. He is your righteousness. You've got the devil accusing you. Oh, I'm a terrible sinner. But Christ is my righteousness. He's my saviour. He'll keep me. I'll be humbled and repentant towards him and seek his blessing. And if you're not saved, be saved. let's pray, let's pray, let's pray. Call upon the Lord. We, we pray, Lord, that each of us here will call upon Thee, that we will, with our hearts, believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and that we will know that we are saved by the blood of Christ and by the righteousness of Jesus Christ and that we look to Him. We, don't, we can't look to ourselves. We can make no pretense, Lord, of being righteous. We're sinners. But Jesus Christ is righteous and the Saviour. Oh Lord, these things are so plain and so simple. But our hearts are deceptive and would hinder us, as would our minds and our affections and our wills. Lord, we would be so stubborn. But we thank thee, Lord, for that, that thou hast worked in many and has brought us repentance and faith in Jesus Christ. And though faith seems like such a small thing, we thank thee that it's the working of thy grace and the working of the righteousness of God counting to us the wonders of Jesus Christ. Oh Lord, we pray that this good news, these glad tidings may not be hidden but may be proclaimed that all that turn to him will be saved and that thy church will be kept and will flourish. And Lord, we pray for thy saving power to come upon our loved ones. Lord, would be merciful to them. Wake them up, Lord, from this sleep, from this establishing their own righteousness, from this foolishness, from the peril, from the danger that they're in, from living without the real God, without the Saviour. Oh Lord, be merciful and bless our loved ones, bless our neighbours, Bless, Lord, our enemies who were like the Apostle Paul that would hate the church. But then he was stopped in his tracks and he knew that Jesus Christ was good and is God and is the Saviour. And he was uh, brought to have no other choice but to know him and to trust him. And Lord, help us to have a real trust and faith in Jesus Christ in these days that we may not be afraid we may be bold even to speak of him, speak of the wonder of his love toward us in saving us. Oh Lord, help us to be thankful for being saved by Jesus Christ and to walk in his ways and to serve thee with gladness. Forgive us, Lord, so much negligence in these matters, so much being taken in again by the snares of the world. Oh Lord, we pray thou bless thy people strengthen them, strengthen those that are in countries where there's much persecution and hatred toward thy people. Oh Lord, we pray that the enemies of Jesus Christ who persecute thy people will be stopped, Lord. We pray that they will be saved, they be converted, and there may be a great gathering in of thy people, Jew and Gentile alike, we pray. In Jesus' name, Amen. Amen.